Well, it is I. <laughs> when I was one and twenty, I heard a wise man say, Give crowns and pounds and guineas, but not your heart away. Give pearls away and rubies, but keep your fancy free. But I was one and twenty, no use to talk to me. When I was one and twenty, I heard him say again, the heart from out the bosom was never given in vain. Tis paid with sighs of plenty and sold for endless room. And now I'm two and twenty, and oh, tis true, tis true. Da, 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 da. <laughs> I'm Clay Nunnally. I'm a professor of English literature at the University of Alaska, Anchorage. I came up here in 1970 and have taught continuously since then until now and I'm about to retire. When I came here there was only a community college. There was the Eugene Short building where I teach now, the Cuddy Center though it was much smaller, what is called the Beatrice McDonald building which is right west of the Short building and then uh, the Sally Monserud building and it was very very different it was just a little college there was most people up here at the time I think were uh, working in hunting fishing one of my classes had only three students in it and then we drove right up to the door most of the courses were at night because most people worked all day but it was fun we were all young that we were a very young faculty all of us had just gotten our degrees and it was very relaxed and I enjoyed it a lot. I look back on those years with, with a feeling of great warmth. I think our faculty maybe was around 50 at that point. Uh, Con Bundy was a speech teacher. He later retired and wound up being a senator for Alaska, state senator for Alaska. Greg Parrish, who was in physics, and Greg only retired about three or four years ago, and we were just all a very young group. We had, you know, composition programs in English, world literature, sophomore level courses. And I think, though I didn't stray too far out of my area, I think the community college was emphasizing hands-on learning, such thing as welding, airplane repair, engine repair, uh, stuff that a frontier-like economy could use to get a job. My greatest achievement is just to hang on. <laughs> you know, Lord, I'm still here with most of my faculties intact. But, oh, I've, I've liked it all. You know, it's, it's been uh, great fun. And it is nice to be, you know, made much of to some degree. Students have been very good to me about awards for this or that or letters of recognition for some meager little contribution I've done for them. Um, so I can't really single out any defining moments except that I look back on all these decades and I realize just what a delightful and rewarding time it's been. Uh, I'm very proud of this department. Uh, fortunately, uh, I was granted the status of Professor Emeritus. I got the word from the Chancellor two or three days ago, which is very kind. A lot of my colleagues wrote letters to see that I would get this, and the Dean Stalvey approved, and it went on up, and I've, I've got it. And one of the things I like about it is that I have library privileges for the rest of my life. I have parking privileges. Uh, I will be welcomed at any university function, so they're making it very easy for me to keep my hand in, in this school, and I'll take advantage of it. And I was chosen last year as the outstanding professor at UAA, and there was a banquet down there at um, the Hilton, I think, and Dan Sullivan, the mayor, was there. And he was kind enough to mention that I had been his teacher <laughs> back then, you know, and God forgive me, I didn't remember it. What actually inspired me to devote my life to university work and university environment was in 1956 driving through eastern Tennessee through the mountains and looking up and seeing a little university on top of a mountain. And I was 13 or 14 and I suddenly just 
knew exactly that's where I wanted to be, some place like it. I wanted quietness, beauty, I wanted gentility, decency, good manners, learning, all of those things, and it just hit, and I never changed my mind once. My background is deep southern. I'm the first person in my family for, well, going all the way back, I suppose, to when Mississippi was settled. Uh, we came in, I think, in the 1700s, 1800s, down in Mississippi and Louisiana. And I'm the first one, actually, to live north of the Mason-Dixon line. And I came up here, and I've enjoyed every minute of it and never regretted it. And on my wall, I have Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson, as you know. They dominate the office. And Lee, I think, is sort of in the same category as Walter Scott. You know, he lost that war through no fault of his own. But what interests me is after the war, he never blamed anyone. He never paced the floor day and night asking himself, what if I'd done this or what if I'd done that? He just got on his horse after he surrendered, went back to Richmond, walked into his home with his wife and children, and started living the last 10 years of his life. And there are no instances, any great anguish in the sense that he tried to relive or second guess what he did. He did the best he could, and then when it was over, win, lose, or draw, he got on with what was left. And I, again, that kind of attitude appeals to me is not to always be worrying about the mistakes I made or what I could have done better and what I did wrong. I think looking back, I've done the best that I can over all my career, and I don't want to wind up uh, being in the doldrums on things that I think I should have done. In my, in my youth, I was a great jump roper. I, I was very good at jumping rope. <laughs> I prided myself on that. It, it, I was training for the big fight. I was going up against Tyson any day. <laughs> but I was, and I, this was when I was living alone in Girdwood. And I'd get up about 2.30, and I had this old mat out there in the living room, and I'd put on all this rock and roll and this wild Irish jigs, and I'd jump rope until I couldn't see straight. And I had a punching bag on the wall, a speed bag, and I'd hit this thing. <laughs> and I'm telling you, all I needed was ca cauliflower ears, and I would have been set. <laughs> but nowadays, I think really what I gravitate to is more classical music. I like Ravel very much. I like the piano work of, of Horowitz, and I, I do like old-timey rock and roll. You ain't but a the older things, Elvis and Brooke Benton and all of those things, I always get a kick out of listening to. And, I, you know, Elvis was born in Tupelo, and I went over to his house one time. And, you know, Mr. Ferran, I've never seen a poor more pathetic looking little house than what Elvis grew up with. It was really not much larger. It was smaller than our classroom. It was called a shotgun house. And it was just like a cut off railroad car. No doors if I remember. The first part had a little gas burner for his mother to cook. The second part I think had an easy chair. And then the third was a bed, a, a, bed, a big bed for all three of them to sleep in. Uh, but I like his music, you know, I, I grew up with that. So those old kinds of southern rock and roll I think is fun. You know, he, he had a big impact on the South. He, there was people, I guess, make fun of him now with all the polyester. But he was very good in rock and roll. He could sing and he had a kind of unusual way about it. And I like his music. I have a lot of it. We had some business in Memphis, Tennessee, which is 100 miles from Tupelo. And I actually went to school there for a while because we were doing some, my parents were doing some, my father was doing some business there. And one of my friends was Gary Rutherford. And we were going to the same high school. We were both in the ninth grade, I think. And this was just when Elvis was becoming famous. And he came to school one day and he said, guess who came over to our house? It's, he said Elvis did because Graceland used to be owned by a doctor, and we used to pass it, and I thought it was a nice house, nothing special. But Gary Rutherford lived next door to it, he, he and his parents. And apparently Elvis went up, bought Graceland, but there was a lot of contra 
controversy about Elvis then with all the shaking and gyrations. And Gary was telling me the next day, he said, we were at dinner, and there was a knock on the door, and my daddy went to answer it, and it was Elvis standing on the front porch. And he said, Mr. Rutherford, I just bought the house next door to you, and if you don't want to live next door to me, I'll understand, and I'll buy your home right now from you. <laughs> and Mr. Rutherford said, Elvis, we'd be delighted to have you there. <laughs> that, that's my signature. That's, that's put my one way to fame, Mr. Ferran. Uh, <laughs> actually, they were popular again. I don't know, maybe I was born old, but they were popular back when I was a young boy. Older men wore them. They still, they came in right after the Civil War, and they lasted till about the 1930s, and then they began to die off in favor of, of other types of glasses, designer glasses and things like that. And when I needed glasses, I found out, I thought, well, heck, I'll just go back and see if I can wear these, get some. And it, it was a heck of a chore trying to find some. And, but if you find a pair that fit, actually, they're very, very handy. There are no shanks. They'll stay on your nose, but that's what the string's for, in case of wind, take a gust of wind to blow it off. But I found I like them, and um, it certainly intimidates the students. And <laughs> I mean, they, when they see me, they don't want to mess with me. <laughs> but but that's, that's the story of these things, and I think I'll wear them all my life. I like them. Yes, you know, I, uh, my reason to retire is probably twofold. I'm still very healthy, thank heaven, and I still love teaching as much as ever. But one thing, my wife, you know, she deserves more than sitting home in Girdwood. She had a heart attack about 15 years ago, and she was a nurse, and we agreed she should not do nursing anymore. It was too stressful. So we get along very well, I'm happy to say, and I just want to have time to be with her and look at things while we still can. I don't want to wait till I'm 80 or 82 to retire. That's one thing. And secondly, quite frankly, Mr. Ferran, the times are passing me by in terms of technology, and I know it. I can struggle along on a computer, but I look at my younger colleagues in their 20s and 30s and their knowledge and their ability to use the, what is it, the information that's out there, the electronic information is staggering compared to me. As you know, I come in with a piece of chalk and a book and that's my, that's my sole routine. And I think it is time to, while the going is good, to turn turn it over to younger people with fresher ideas, more perhaps expert ways of conveying information, more variety on how to get information to the students. And I've had a good run. And uh, fortunately, uh, the students seem to appreciate my style of teaching, but it's time now to fold my tent and steal away. I've had the best life in the world. I don't know of anyone, as I've said, you know, more suited to the academic life and working with students than, than I have been. Heaven knows there are a lot better scholars in this school than I am, but I don't think anyone could enjoy it more. And if I've had some sort of impact on students that's positive, I'm very grateful for it. And um, again, I owe everything I am to my glasses. That's... <laughs> <laughs> But when I get home, you make it all worthwhile. You make me laugh, and you make me smile. And after a hard day, sorting out the files, you make it all worthwhile. Would you like steamed pudding and custard for afters? Darling, that would be marvelous. And when I
I suppose of all of the romantics that I teach, I think probably the most admirable personality was Walter Scott. And he had, the last six years of his life, a horrible time, going bankrupt and everything. But it was amazing to see with what courage and good humor he handled all these adversities. And I think as I'm getting into the twilight of my life, those kinds of examples of, you know, not become cynical or self-pitying or not to refuse to enjoy everything that you possibly can enjoy, those kinds of people mean a lot to me.